Yeah. When do we end? We end at about 8:30 ish for the talk. Yeah. Okay. I'll do my best. Coming from the light man. Yeah, and then we we re edit too. We type it up. And then it goes to the website? Yeah. Okay, cool. There's a lot of content. Not really all the talks are just the actual. All right. I'll let people trickle in. No glares, just welcome. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Rogue Valley Metaphysical Library, um, our Tuesday night lecture series. We, our original location was on A Street, and we did these two Tuesday night lectures for about 10 years, every Tuesday night. So when we got this building, it was designed, that's why we have the screen coming out and the projector and all that. Um, about four years ago, this is one of the things that we had in mind to do. And then we had a coffee shop in here and she was open at night, so we didn't get to do it. And then COVID came. And then, so we had to wait about three years to start the lecture series. So we're really happy to be able to do this again. Um, we are a 501c3 nonprofit, so we pretty much all the items, books, and everything are donated by the community. And we have not only a, <clears throat> this is a, our bookshop with very low price books in very good shape that you're welcome to browse. And we have our lending library, which is our main mission, which has been for 20 years. And uh, we also have a media exchange where you can bring things in, take things out. It's just a community service that we do. So come and check us out if you haven't. Well, we're open 10 to 6 every day except for Sunday and Monday. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Jordan Blacktop. He was uh, <clears throat> born and raised in Western Michigan into a family of mental health professionals where his interest in the science of mind began at a very young age. Dr. Blacktop received his undergraduate degree in biopsychology, graduate degree, PhD in biology and neuroscience, and was a postdoctoral research fellow, visiting scholar, and assistant professor. He studied, researched, and taught how the brain changes function because of drug use and how to prevent relapse. At a pivotal moment in his academic career, Dr. Blacktop was gifted with a sudden, unexpected, and powerful and transformative emergent process, what some might call spiritual, mystical, etc., and is scientifically referred to as emergent phenomena. This led to an ongoing and integrated process of the scientific with the emergent. The connection between emergent phenomena and addiction led to his interest in an integrative approach to both substance use and mental health disorders, which led to the development of his company, Soul Science LLC, which bridges the gap from science and the emergent for healing purposes. Oh. So I'll let Dr. Blacktop take over. Oh, from thank there. you, Nikki. Call me Jordan. Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a neurological imprint, by the way. <laughs> You just, it's with you, you carry it with you, but it's not who you are. <laughs> we'll, we'll come into that. So we have a, a, quite a bit a, of ground to cover. I just want to get this out there. So we're going to try to keep uh, questions to the end. Um, and then I'm happy to talk deeply and you know, extensive answers when needed. But we're going to try to stay on track. But if it's something that can assist you, that can be answered very quickly with regards to following along, that would be excellent. We can just do a quick, quick uh, question and answer. So to give the punchline, both the cause and the cure for addiction resides in the need and drive for wholeness, period. 
so the cure and the cause are within. within. And we can see slowly that there's an alchemical process when you hit rock bottom that can be a transformative experience facilitating <coughs> growth. I'm talking about the meaning of life, which is soul evolution. So if you can alchemize this, then that's where we go. So let's give it a shot. We can get an advancement here. There we go. Today we're going to talk about addiction as a disease model. I'm going to present to you the typical academic perspective that I was taught. We're going to go into some therapeutics briefly, look at trauma, we're going to look at psychedelics and spirituality, and we're going to come from not only a perspective that I've experienced, but also one I've researched, one that I have ex seen in other people, and one that may be controversial. But what good is it if you don't ruffle feathers here and there? right? So addiction, dis-ease, lack of ease or comfort. And when we look at the disease model, we're looking at the effects of drugs on the brain, period. How the brain works with drugs, how the drugs change the brain, how the changes of the brain control behavior. This is what I did for 15 years. <clears throat> this is only part of what really matters. It's not the cure. So what is substance use disorder? So we're going to use SUD, substance use disorder, DSM-5. But it's basically the clinical term for addiction, chronic relapsing dis-ease of the brain characterized by loss of control over intake, decreased drive for natural reward. So now the drug's replacing natural reward, and you increase relapse vulnerability even when you haven't used a drug for long periods of time. You can go a decade. Philip Seymour Hoffman, one of my favorite actors. We'll talk about how neuroplasticity comes in with that abstinence and then going back and using the same amount of drug. DSM-5, I think they're working on DSM-6. This is the Psychological Diagnostic Manual for Mental Disorders. And they characterize SUD as recurrent, significant clinical functional. So it's impairing your life, basically. You're having problems in your life. It has a, a scale. It can be mild to severe. And it combines abuse and dependence into one substance use disorder category now. So basically a blanket umbrella, substance use disorder. And they replace legal problems with craving, which is an important, because we're looking at the physiological response. So you can kind of think about how the DSM thinks they're being ahead of the curve with replacing craving with legal problems. But within a structured system, it takes decades for the changes to trickle in. So let's poke the bear at the stick a little bit. can do this. Here we go. This is just saying it's an acquired disease of the brain, meaning that, yes, the initial voluntary action to take a drug is a voluntary action. But it, it becomes acquired in that you lose control. It affects the brain. And I'm just going to show you why it's a disease. And this is just showing you that it relapse rates are similar to other health problems that you have. You have type 1 diabetes, hypertension, asthma. So it's within there. The majority of people who try a drug don't, do not become addicted, right? We've all tried drugs. So the majority do not become addicted. And then this is more of a societal slide where I just make a plug to reduce stigmatization. Because it's very harmful when you look into someone's eyes and you refer to them as an addict. When you see shame in someone's eyes. There's no room for shame in this world when you're searching for wholeness and bliss within yourself. How dare you shame someone for that? So I always encourage using substance use disorder instead of addiction, which I will use addiction interchangeably for the purposes of the talk, to avoid calling someone a label such as an addict. Yes? It's the same thing. It's just. Well, I have to think about that. I'll get back to you on that one at the end. There's many different approaches to that. So you could replace substance with something else. The word substance with the. 
with uh, another factor, basically. Use disorder of some sort. So avoid triggering terms. So when you use substance, it's less triggering. Drugs can actually induce craving. Drugs. When you associate the term drugs with dopamine, you're like, yes, give me some more of that shit right now. That sounds good. Let's turn that physi physiology on. I'll minimize swearing, but every once in a while it's okay. I learned that at the university when their students were nodding off. You drop a little bit of a swear word. They're like, wait a minute, I heard I heard a lot. <laughs> So addiction and substance use disorder is cyclic in the sense that you, you, you get a good feel good, then you don't feel good anymore, then you want to feel good, and it creates a cycle. So what drives this? Well, obviously you have a plethora of things. And this is, keep in mind, this is the academic traditional approach, and then we're going to go into a different one. You have genetics. You have the effects of the drug, and you have the environment, and together they interact. And really, how can you pinpoint the cause of something that's this complex and integrated? Comes down to wholeness again. Why do they take drugs to feel good? So, what do positive reinforcement is going to increase the likelihood of doing it again because it feels good? And when it feels good, what they've pinpointed is an area in the brain called the nucleus accumbens. It's in your limbic system. And when people say dopamine, 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 they're referring to an increase of dopamine, usually at a clinical level, in this area of the brain called the nucleus accumbens. And they're just looking at, you can think about the colors from low to high. They're actually just looking at receptors. Which is, an which is an indirect indicator of the neurotransmitter, so you have to be very careful of how you look at that. You're looking at basically low to high. So red's high expression. I'm sorry for the cameraman over there. I'm going to keep him working. My fault. There you go. So just to give you an idea of the, the neurocircuitry of addiction, <clears throat> this is the main circuit that has been studied it's the mesocortical limbic system, meso being midbrain. That's the ventral tegmental area where the dopamine comes from, meso. Cortico, cortex, prefrontal cortex, limbic, nucleus accumbens. And we don't have to get too far into this, but you can basically think about it as a circuit. And that circuit itself facilitates the reward, the feel good, that part of your body that feels damn good when you use something. This is one of the main circuits that allows for that to happen. Everything's connected. So once you tweak one part, it all adjusts. It took me 15 years to figure that out. So when we start manipulating intracranially, what good is that clinically when everything else adjusts? So we need more of a holistic approach. Substance effects, neuroplasticity. Brain changes function, like Plato. Drug-induced or substance-induced neuroplasticity, the brain changes function as a result of being exposed to drug. And this comes into the Newtonian physics of for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. So I'll show you evidence for this unfortunate physics law sometimes here in this world with regards to when you feel good, you feel bad, yin and yang, pendulum swing of addictions, of substance use disorder. But ideally, in other realms, proportionately balanced would be a better response than equal and opposite. So if we can target a proportionally balanced response instead of equal and opposite, then you have less of a pendulum swing and able to find that neutral point. And that's something that we need to t take into consideration. The theory behind addiction needs to change in order to treat it. So for equal and opposite, you do a drug over time, you don't get the same effects anymore. You don't feel as good. You have to take more and more. And it's a switch from feeling good to avoiding feeling bad. It's from positive to negative reinforcement. You feel good, now you're just taking it to avoid feeling bad. You no longer get to feel good, right? Feel good's gone. 
So this involves tolerance and withdrawal. Tolerance, you just have to take more of the drug to get the same effect. Withdrawal is when you have negative side effects when you don't have the drug. Because now, homeostasis, maintaining a particular optimal state, the body's always adjusting. So now it gets used to the drug, and you're not really supposed to feel that way because it's super physiological, meaning it's not at the normal level of stimulation for the body. So then you get that going on. And this is where if you go 10, 15 years without taking a drug and you go back, you fall into the same environment and you take the same amount of drug and you no longer have tolerance, you die. Philip Seymour Hoffman, right? You die. You overdose. But you're going to go for the optimum euphoria. You're going to go gangbusters for it. If you've gone that long, you're going to be like, I'm going to try to do that. You know, people who have done heroin will say, you can try to chase it, but it's not going to be better than the first time you ever did it, ever. So this is just showing basically that the amount of dopamine in the nucleus accumbens decreases when you have substance use disorder, producing hypoactivity or decreased dopamine in the brain at normal states. And now the only thing that activates the brain itself is drug to feel normal. So now you're using a drug to activate the brain to a normal level of function, basically. Because you're no longer feeling good. So that's just neuroplasticity in a nutshell. It happens for everything. I can make the argument I think alcohol probably one of the more devastating drugs out there. My drug of choice when I was a workaholic. OK, so that's dopamine hypoactivity. And then craving, hypofrontality, decreased function of the cortex. So this is normal. This is a person going through substance use disorder. And you're looking at activity. Here's a, a cocaine-related interview and a neutral theme. Now only the drug-related stimuli activate the brain, whereas neutral themes and interactions aren't. So now the prefrontal cortex is streamlined to responding to drugs over natural things. So now it's being tra entrained to focus on the drug itself as what the life starts to revolve around, right? This is where a physiological indices. This is not the cause. This is just monitoring. This is a symptom of addiction. I want to make that very clear. Neuroplasticity of the brain is a symptom. Symptomology. Negative reinforcement, so we talked about equal opposite, that you have reward, and then it's going to recruit an anti-reward system. This is what I studied. And basically, you become more re reactive and emotional. And you have a recruitment of your emotional part in memory, your amygdala. You have all these different 11 other hormones and neurotransmitters involved. But long story short, the stress system becomes recruited. And at a normal state, your stress system's at a hyperactivity drive. So not only now do you not get as much reward, you're stressed out, and you're spiraling out of control at a physiological level. And this is just so showing activation of that particular part of the brain, the amygdala, involved in um, emotion and memory that's activated as a result of drug-related stimuli. So it's being recruited. So if we could summarize everything up to this point, the way the brains change function of the, uh, the way the drugs change uh, function of the brain, you produce a perfect storm to drive addiction or substance use disorder. You have decreased reward, decreased dopamine, decreased frontal cortex function or inhibitory control. So no, now you can't control your behavior as well. You don't feel as good, you can't control your behavior, and you're emotionally reactive. Tell me that isn't a perfect storm. And anything such as cues, stress, drugs themselves, substances, all of them can produce craving that then creates the storm. Yeah. OK. So treatment, <clears throat> some of the clinical treatments, if we develop a normal system, the structured system, pharmacological intervention to block the craving, to feel good, to feel bad. 
cognitive behavioral therapy, intervention programs, reinforcement of behavior, and abstinence. Those are the treatments. Abstinence, critical. This is just a, a slide showing you that with abstinence from methamphetamine that you can actually get back to almost normal levels of control of the dopamine system with time. That over time you can, the system will adjust back which is an important aspect of the brain. A lot of people would make the argument, we don't know if it's permanent, this or that. Well, nothing's permanent in the material world, is it? Or else it wouldn't have change. So this is an interesting slide. Let's throw drugs at something. This is what we do, right? We have a cycle of addiction. We target different parts of the cycle. Feel good. Let's block them from getting high. Let's block them from feeling like crap. Let's block them from, from wanting it. But if dis-ease is in fact started at an energetic level, and it goes from energy to physical matter, including chemical, how do you expect to treat addiction at a material level with chemicals? It's not going to happen. Yeah? They are under the right circumstances. You can die from withdrawal. Absolutely. They're useful tools used in moderation. In conjunction with a holistic perspective, absolutely. But it's not the silver bullet we're trying to, to search for. Because they have side effects. Too. They have side effects, yep. And everything is adjusting, right? So we're just moving the pendulum around. We're just moving target. It's just a moving target. And then you wonder why they're not stabilized. Put them in the rainforest with a fast and a cleanse an abstinence and allow the body to adjust back to a homeostatic state. That would be much more effective because you go back to balance. So cognitive behavioral therapy, that's, we know what that is and that helps with executive function of the cortex, very effective. Contingency management, you reinforce desired behavior and when they do something wrong, such as using drugs, you, you withhold something, positive and negative reinforcement. One of the most powerful things you can do right now is community reinforcement. Connection. Connection. When you have a structure and you have love and you have connection, that's going to help. Okay, so heart-brain coherence, it's going to briefly touch on this. That's basically the heart connecting to the brain. The heart sends more connections to the brain than the brain does the heart. What does this mean? It basically means that in order to function optimally, physiologically, we want to engage the heart with our nervous system. We want our heart to drive signals to our brain to allow us to flow. We talk about being in the flow state, right? Flow state. It's coherent. You don't have to think. Michael Jordan on a buzzer beater, right? That's flow. And the whole is greater than the sum of its individual parts, and it involves connectedness and wholeness. And there's techniques involved that are really important here. Heart Math Research Institute, and there's plenty of things going on there that are very efficient. This helps with a decrease in reactivity as well. So that's a promising target. Trauma. We live in a traumatized society. Everyone has trauma. It's just degrading how much you have. It's one of the most, one of the main fundamental causes of substance use disorder and mental health problems. And even EMDR, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, is utilized for trauma. But it's been underutilized for addiction because of the lack of connection with trauma and addiction. But there's evidence, one of the few articles that I found, that can actually say that EMDR trauma treatment is effective against substance use disorder, showing that there's a trauma underlying there. In consciousness, we're going to tap into this a little bit deeper. Increased self-awareness, mindfulness techniques, meditation. Expand the consciousness, and we're going to get into this. Transcendent state or beyond the self. Beyond the self. Low S, little self. Empowerment, delicate balance of self-empowerment. Take away the stigmatization and empower them.
releasing to a higher power. We talk about that. But why? Why is this 12 step program effective for some and not others? I, I was forced to do that at one point. I can tell you why. It's another day. But I'll be working with people who have been court ordered, and that's, one of, that's my next calling, is I'll be working with people who've gone through this. And I want to make sure that we make it something very clear, that the symptomology, what I just showed you, that's how we were researching it. That's how we were looking at addiction in academics. It's progressing, yes. But what's, what's being reinforced? Looking for consciousness in the brain is like looking inside a radio for the announcer. OK? We're, we're little satellites, aren't we? We're little antennas looking inside. Not that kind of looking inside. That's not what we're looking for. Brain and mind, I just want to make a few different discrepancies, you know, some Distinctions, thank you. Brain itself is a soft nervous system organ within the skull that functions as the coordinating center of sensation, intellect, and nervous system activity. That's from the dictionary. So when in doubt, I just went literal. <laughs> Let's just do literal dictionary. Mind, because there's so many nuances in context. Mind is a combination of your brain and eternal consciousness. You're not going to find that in a dictionary, though. Eternal consciousness. That's the difference between the brain and the mind. Consciousness equals energy. All is energy, all is mind, all is consciousness. Everything's energy, right? We're entering that phase where we're going to have to reapply and relearn this. So if energy can neither be created nor destroyed, and we are eternal consciousness, how is that not spiritual? We have three brains, the head, the gut, the heart. Let's just open it up now. Eternal consciousness works through and expresses itself in resonance and energy expansion and contraction through processing of these organs and these brains. Temporary holding point so we can experience the material world. So in addictions, there's a, a good group looking at heart-brain coherence, which has been able to strengthen the emotional self-regulation, synchronize the physiology, resilience, and greater connection, and relapse prevention. So that's one thing we can look at. Another underutilized tool where you're facilitating heart-brain coherence to treat something that is at a material dysregulation. We're treating ourselves like machines. No longer can we do that. And so a lot of this next upcoming material came from the Masters series, an Imagination and Addiction uh, edition. Wonderful series. Give them a plug. Uh, credit where it's due. Uh, Dr. Garber Mate, Addiction and Trauma, and um, Dr. David Nutt, Addiction and Psychedelics. And we're going to go and touch in on trauma and the sense of self. Addiction is an attempt to solve a problem. Addiction is not a disease. It is a doomed attempt to solve a problem and causes a disease. What's the damn problem? <laughs> Trauma. You have emotional responses to deeply distressing, disturbing experiences, which we typically relate to trauma. Combat veterans. Right? But what about wounding? When your needs are not met, or mis this is a misattunement, according to Dr. Garbamonte. Misattunement is when your emotional needs are not noticed, reflected, or met. Empath narcissist dynamic. Has anyone experienced that? Okay. And for sensitive children, a lack of attunement can be very wounding. And as a result of the wounding, become more sensitive.
What about emotional pain? It's a craving for pleasure, for short-term relief, leading to long-term problems and an inability to give it up. The cause can be all states of emotional pain. It's not why the addiction, but what is driving their pain. This is a compassionate inquiry developed by Dr. Garbamante. It relieves shame, removes shame. It's not their brain circuits, but their lives. The brain circuits are symptomology. So epigenetics talk about their lives, conditioning, the epigenetic overlay, study of heritable changes in gene expression, where you can have activation or inhibition of genes, and it doesn't necessarily involve the DNA sequence. Phenotype is basically the external expression at the physical level, and genotype is what's happening at the, at the genetic level. But then your environment can change how your genes interact. It can be turned on, turned off, and they can be transmitted through multi-generational aspects. So what you get exposed to in a particular life can be transmitted to the next generation at a genetic level. Anyone else think that trauma does that? Okay. And this is key to forming personality, your sense of self, your conditioning, your belief systems about the nature of reality. What if we can shatter that? And if any other questions? Yeah, in a good way. <laughs> yeah, in a good way. Conceptually. Yeah, conceptually. We're talking about, yeah. Not in the traditional sense. We're talking about <laughs> structure of the, how we're relating to it at a cognitive level, cognitization of it, the mental construct. So what I was thinking we're referring to was the mental construct of it. So if we can change our perception, our perspective. Thank you for the clarity. I'm going to make sure that's clear. <laughs> YouTube land, better make that one clear. What if we can shatter your life? <laughs> that was already shattered. Um, so there's different ways you can see different external stimuli in the world that come in, they interact with your genes, they can tag something, and then they can either open it up or close it and make it responsive, active, or inactive. It's not a molecular biology course, but this is just some me general mechanisms of how epigenetics works. Not to mention what we're considering junk DNA. It isn't junk. So we're going to, in future generations, we're going to understand uh, that it all has function. In fact, miraculous function. So trauma and addiction circuits don't develop properly. So while this is still Garbamate Garba stuff, they don't develop and then they produce an addiction prone personality. And that involves emptiness, a sense of deficiency, shame, and inability to be alone with the pain. And addiction is not genetic. It's the genes that they're finding was argued by Dr. Garber Mate to code for sensitivity. So sensitivity. Mm -hmm. so, so yeah, so let's just, yeah, so these are really key points that need to be implemented. And that's why I'm putting them here. And it's not anything except his genius and compassion. It's really, he's driven by compassion. One of the most compassionate people I've seen. Okay. Let's see if we can advance here. There we go. There's a social perspective to addiction we're seeing. Deaths of despair, National Institute of Health was really interested in this, globalization of addiction. And that perspective doesn't deny the individual vulnerability differences between the positive of social determinants and being more powerful, but the cause between these different perspectives is a globaliza globalization, free market, society, and capitalism. Why, what is that doing? Socioeconomic stress, producing indiv individualism in competition, separation and pain. It's producing separation and pain. This is one of the reasons our society is traumatized. Despair, need to fill an inner void, we have a void. Opposite of addiction is connection and inner peace. Wholeness. Wholeness. Psychedelics and addiction, part three. So drugs produce a biophysiological effect. 
Medicines treat disease. Addictions rooted in trauma and unresolved emotion. And so if we look at it this perspective, I'll make the argument that psychedelics are both a drug and a medicine. They do produce a biophysiological effect and they can treat disease under a set and setting, providing insight and learning under their appropriate conditions. But I have to ask you a question with psychedelics. And it helps you move beyond the conditioned personality to touch the true self to treat disease, sure. Context, set and setting, it's gotta be set and setting, very important, even my hippie father would tell me that. Thank you, Dad. Focus, it needs to be on integration, not the experience. So I ask you, if you take a, a psychedelic, are you altering or are you entering altered or transcendent consciousness? How do you discern the difference between altered and transcendent consciousness? It's a big difference there, isn't it? You know how easy it is to get, get lost in the experience of altered consciousness and thinking you're integration transcendent? Transcendent. And do you need drugs necessarily to do that? No. You don't. But it can open you up to get past some of the trauma, but then you're open. And are you in a set and setting? What are you opening up to? Okay. Not all drugs of abuse result in detectable increases in dopamine in man. What? It's not all dopamine? Damn it. Thought I had it cured. Beyond dopamine, dopamine mechanisms have failed to treat addiction. Dopamine is protective against addiction because you don't have to compensate for it. There's other roles involved with dopamine. Habit and impulsivity, they're all linked. Not just reward and feel good. Here, let me take this thing and fly high on the dopamine train. Yes? What does that mean, dopamine is, um, what was it, Peter, that last slide that was protective against addiction? That when you have a certain level of dopamine in your system at a natural level, mm -hmm. you're less likely to need drug. Mm -hmm. So if you have less dopamine, you're more than likely to search for a compensatory increase of, of dopamine. Um, there's other paths, neurotransmitters. You have dopamine being, you know, of course, yeah, we have pleasure and wanting, yes, but we have GABA inhibitory, so it shuts parts of the brain off ish. Glutamate, so this is involved in memory. You have endorphins, pain reduction, serotonin for meaning, self control, sense of self. But we're looking at endorphins being released as well in the, that neural circuit. So there's a role for endorphins, and endorphin blockers are good at treating addiction. What are endorphins? I'm not going through this. But basically, they're endogenous, natural, occurring opioid peptides and receptors. So it's a natural analgesia, pain reliever, reward part of the body, basically. So if we look at psychedelics and serotonin, we have mescaline, we have psilocybin, we have amanita muscaris, we have LSD, we have ayahuasca, ergot. Everything across here except for Amanita muscaris, uh, GABA, man, that's a wild ride if you mess with GABA too much, right? But we, what you can kind of see here is a, is a real case-sensitive point in serotonin receptors being activated. It works through serotonin in the brain. Here are serotonin receptors, specifically the 5H2A, within the cortex. Look at all those receptors in the cortex designed to be activated. And within the cortex, we have something called a default mode network, and that encodes the sense of self. Talk about the cortex. Different parts of the cortex are connected. And that connection and activity allows you and gives you that sense of who you are, that sense of self, that Jordan, right? That neurological imprint, the false Complementary introduction, right? That's the little S. 
a greater default mode, you have a basically in depression you have a connectivity issue where you have rumination, you have over over sense of self. Psilocybin is effective in treatment resistant depression. Well, that's great, excellent. So now we're looking at the default mode network. So. One of the things I want to just make clear is that we're going to use the default mode network connectivity and activation. They're different because that's going to be a material indices of the sense of self from the neuroscience data I'm going to show. But it's just that. It's material indices symptomology, but it gives us an idea. What about brain connectivity? Psychedelics do produce neuroplasticity and they increase brain connectivity. And I asked the question, well, is it increasing the sense of the little self or the increase of the bigger self? And we're going to go into that. And interestingly, education decreases global brain connectivity. <laughs> so keep that in mind. Uh, so connectivity is important. That's just basically how hardwired globally your brain is. When you go into education, you, ha you have a few circuits that are just hammered. And a few circuits, you know, let's make those ones that we really want really strong. And all the other stuff, we can just throw that out, spare parts. Like, you don't ever want your mechanics to stay in your car at spare parts. So, DMN and addiction, default mode network and addiction. It's not connected normally, and it's facilitated with craving and relapse. You have increased activity, but decreased connectivity. So, connectivity. Increased sense of self, decreased executive function, um, and it's engaged and recruited during the substance use disorder process at the expense of executive control. Nora Volkow is the director of NAT NIDA, the National Institute of Drug Abuse. Now, part four, addiction and spirituality. How do we connect the dots here? Brand new, hot off the press, had nothing else to do in the cabin. Just kidding. We all have something to do, right? Okay. So we want to take the spiritual life as part of the human essence. It is a divining characteristic of human nature, without which human nature is not fully human. This is Maslow, Maslow's hierarchy, introductory psychology. Hmm, where was that on the Maslow hierarchy? Okay, way up there. So we have biological, we have psychological, social, and spiritual. Okay, we need that component. Biopsychosocial spiritual model is a holistic approach that acknowledges the interaction between the physical, the psychological, the social, and the spiritual aspects to patient care and patient well-being. And then we're going to go into what is a spiritual. You know, all my clients, it's whatever it is to that person. <laughs> What if I were to make the argument that drugs don't give you reward, they temporarily show you your true state of bliss? Sat yes. Existence, yes. Existence, consciousness, and bliss. Your true origin. So why wouldn't, it, why wouldn't people be searching for bliss? It's your true state. Right? Satchitananda, and being, existence or being, consciousness and bliss, your true nature, unconditioned state is bliss, ananda. And it leaves it only sometimes more and less evident. But drugs do not produce bliss. They temporarily reveal your natural blissful state. You tell someone who's suffering from substance use disorder that, whew, we think about that. That's my natural state. How do I get the right dose every time? Perfectly balanced dose, I have to deal with all this garbage I'm dealing with. How do I get that perfect balanced state of bliss? If it's my natural state, what's blocking me from my natural state? Behind every craving is a thirst for transcendence or wholeness. Controversial figure, yes I know. But it's okay. We can put a white guy with a cigar pipe up there, right? Mm -hmm. 
but we're, multi we're diversifying. <coughs> now, this is a very important definition. Spirituality has been defined as the experience of conscious involvement in the project of life integration through self-transcendence toward the ultimate value one perceives. Sandra Schneider's very famous professor. So I highlighted integration and transcendence. So if we look at that definition of spirituality, spirituality defined. And this is for context and reference point. So every, there's difference. So if we could just follow with me here, this is for just context so I can relay information under a context of information for a reference point to understand the material. It isn't necessarily, I think, what I'm presenting is truthful over other things. Integration, to bring together multiple parts to function as one. Transcendence, to rise or above or go beyond limits. So with soul science, I've defined spirituality as working towards synchronizing the many parts of the self to go beyond limitations and boundaries, to find more wholeness, and as a result, unconditioned true state of bliss. That's how I define spirituality. Central to this approach are the meaning, purpose, and core values of the individual, meaning that spirituality is specific to each and every person. It doesn't matter what another person thinks or feels. It has to be felt within that individual, and the dots need to be connected and felt. It's, you can't even think your way through this. It's not going to help. You have to feel it. Thinking isn't going to get you through it. You have to feel it. It's got to be, ah. But I, you, I just had this aha moment, and I tried to call my parents and explain it to them, and they said, oh, yeah. But you're like, you're I totally deflated where I was at. Why did it deflate where you were? Because you felt it. They heard it. So in this view, spiritual is a broad term that can be applied to any aspect of life. That's what is important about integration of science and spirituality. There is no separation and never was. It's an illusion. Now, any, many people know this. Many people feel this. But let's just get more people out there. Get more people out there, wherever this goes. Online, welcome. So again, sense of self, activity of that circuit, and dysfunction and addiction. Um, involves all these different transmitters, an increased sense of self relieved by drug use. Might be a repeat. Where am I going here? Here we go. Okay, good. Meditation, the transcendent state beyond the self. Meditation increases neuroplasticity of the reward circuit, results in joy, activation of the cortex, and nucleus accumbens. So what is that going to do? It's going to help treat the decrease in dopamine as a result of drug use as well as increased activity of the prefrontal cortex, hypofrontality and hypodopaminergic activation. So decreased dopamine, decreased cortex function. Meditation helps um, change the neuroplasticity of the drug. So the neuroplasticity of the drug produces decrease in dopamine, decrease in executive function of the cortex. Meditation does the opposite of that, increases dopamine and increases executive function. So we should be saying, well, you need to learn how to meditate. And someone who's going through withdrawal, that's hard to do, isn't it? But that's one approach. Um, so meditation with the activity, that circuit, and increases connectivity. So connectivity, you can have decreased activity, but increased connectivity. So you have increased connectivity, decreased activity in the, sense, in the sense of self as a result of meditation. So your brain's more connected. You're going the opposite of, of scholastic induction and imprinting, indoctrinization, aren't we, when we meditate? And we decrease the activity of that circuit, and we decrease the sense of self, lower S. Longer but permanent. Meditation takes longer to achieve these effects with the brain, but they're more permanent. Versus psychedelics, which is short, impermanent, 
and you don't know whether you are in an altered or transcendent state of consciousness and you're open. What if you were safer meditating, not meaning that you have anything to protect yourself from, but you're more like an autonomous, sovereign being made of energy in material form that allows you to get the most out of all that you can be. So that again, mental and substance use disorders caused by trauma, inhibited wholeness or spirituality, I'll use those interchangeably sometimes. Trauma, we have turmoil and trauma is one of the greatest triggers for spiritual awakening processes, including prolonged bouts of addiction and grief. Addictions can lead to a spiritual awakening. Grief can lead to a spiritual awakening. So what can inhibit spirituality or wholeness can paradoxically also facilitate long-term spiritual transformation. So this is work by Steve Taylor looking at a set of 90-something awakening experiences. This was, uh, first saw this at Integrated Mental Health University, um, Alchemizing Addiction, a wonderful unit. Check that out with Emma Bragdon. Plug for you, Emma. How are you doing? Um, he looked at all these and they categorized it. Psychological turmoil, number one. Bereavement, diagnosis of cancer, addiction, intense stress or depression, number one for an awakening state experience, cause, cause of an, an awakening experience. Second, nature. Third, spiritual practice, meditation, prayer, and yoga. Fourth, spiritual literature. Fifth, love and sex. Tied for last, performing arts and psychedelics. Last, psychedelics. I'm sorry, Ashland. <laughs> not that I'm anti-psychedelic. I'm not. I had a hippie fa clinical psychologist father. Trust me. We're okay. It helps you get to this point. What am I saying, right? But let's keep this in consideration and context. You're more likely to have a spiritual awakening process from turmoil than you are psychedelics. This is the difference between altered and transcendent. Right here. <clears throat> so psychedelics result in only temporary dissolution of the little self and relatively low rates of permanent transformative awakening experiences, according to this study. Let's poke a bear and ruffle some feathers. Yes, let's keep, let's keep it going. Psychological turmoil of addiction is more, more likely to cause a permanent transformative awakening experience in psychedelics. And we are seeing increased psychological turmoil and increased awakening experiences in our world right now, are we not? We are in the middle of a collective consciousness evolution. And many smart people have suggested that the trauma is a driving force behind this. It may not necessarily be that case, but when things get bad, you've got to adjust. We need to get rid of separation and find connection. Fragmentation replaced with wholeness. So Steve Taylor, you can find his information. That was his study. And he's got a brilliant mind and a brilliant alchemical approach to addictions and um, spiritual processing. Transformative awakening experiences result in dissolution of the sense of self and integration into wholeness with a new higher functioning self that was latent and waiting to emerge. A higher functioning self that was latent, incubating, waiting. Who here feels like there's a higher self waiting to emerge? What about life? Is that part of soul evolution, trying to find that higher self to emerge? This is what I call the little self to the big self. Transitioning from the conditioned epigenetic overlay self to the bigger connection cosmos self where you are a radio receiver but you are the consciousness coming into the radio receiver not 
the radio receiver perceiving itself, not the radio thinking it looks good in a mirror. Spirals within spirals. Kundalini is the most disruptive, energetic, long-term, and transformative awakening experiences. Kundala means coiled, as in a spiral or spiral motion. If you want to attribute it to a stake, that is your prerogative. Psycho-spiritual cosmic, invisible, intrinsic, and vital consciousness energy field to all of life. Let me repeat that. Kundalini is a psycho-spiritual, cosmic, invisible, intrinsic, and vital consciousness energy field to all of life. And it's involved in the integration in the higher dimensions of consciousness, the bigger self. What cannot be fetally integrated into your DNA is stored at the base of your spine and released upon awakening. Biospiritual evolution in consciousness. A lot gets a lot more complicated rather quickly, but that's just how I boiled it down. Kundalini ascends, clearing trauma, opening vortices of consciousness or chakras, eroding and dissolving conditioned self and ego at the genetic overlay. Little self to big self via energy consciousness induced neuroplasticity. I managed to even find a research article suggesting that you have increased DMN or sense of self connectivity with kundalini, but not activation. Connectivity, global connectivity, not activation. So you can read an article and say, oh, this is the opposite of what I thought it was because it's increased activation. You got to just connectivity versus activation. You have GABA, inhibitory neurotransmitter. That basically decreases activity, but can fac that facilitate a global connection and raise things up in resonance of consciousness where you're reverberating at a level that allows you to interact with your reality in a way that's beyond being a radio. So addiction treatment, <clears throat> basically I've made an argument that it needs to involve biological, energetic, psychological, emotional, social, cultural, and spiritual. And then you have to make the question, we always kind of try to parcelate and fragmentize. Oh, thank you. Give it a name and compartmentalize it. And this is one of the things that I'm working on with uh, a friend of mine, John Norman, who's a professor at Madison, Wisconsin. And we have a video series on YouTube, the Soul Science Channel. And we talk about parcelation of the scientific um, approach and structure and what needs to happen and how to integrate some of these spiritual aspects. So anyone you think that would be interested in that, it's a free uh, explorative educational series that I've just launched for the YouTube channel. So divine alchemy of addiction. The cause and cure for addiction both reside within the drive and need to become whole within oneself through integration and self-transcendence and awareness and consciousness to achieve the natural state of bliss. That is what I have for you today. It's my argument, my thesis. Very simple thesis, right? But I had to build the data up and then we just funnel it in, try to summarize it, bring it in, bring the cone in. And for any additional resources, visit soulscience.org. It's a coaching site right now, uh, but it's going to be developed into education um, and outreach. And uh, you can get a hold of me at jordan.blocktop at soulscience.org. And for those additional videos coming up, starting a, a series, it's been filmed, but I'm going to start releasing them either bi-weekly or weekly for those integrative processing the Education of Science and Spirituality with the What's Up Doc series. You can find that at the Soul Science channel. So we covered a lot of ground in an hour. And so, um, kind of a lot. But now we have plenty of time to chat. So cameraman, that's it for the normal PowerPoint. Thank you everyone online who's made it.
and we have plenty of time for questions and can delve down different avenues and I would facilitate a group discussion here with the people here. It's not happenstance that people are here. So we're going to have an interactive group discussion, not a uh, Jordan stands up here and tries to regurgitate answers to things. This is a group, a group thing. Okay? Okay. Any questions or salient points, things that stuck out? Slides you'd like to go back? Thoughts? Criticisms are fine. Yeah. So before you started the talk, you were talking about <clears throat> someone who <clears throat> wanted to get help for their loved one that had addiction and basically said, well, if that has to come within them, right? Mm -hmm. um, so going back to the slide where you had like the factors for awakening, mm -hmm. psychedelics was on the bottom and, and you know, turmoil was on top. Mm -hmm. I wonder if that changes um, if you've already hit the turmoil, right? Like if you already realize, like, I have this issue, and then you go into the Intention is, changes can change anything. So is that what they mean by that each person's getting to the wall of the road? Is that what they say? <laughs> is that what that means? That's like, you know, so everybody has a threshold of what they can take. Yeah. So is that what they mean by that? Yeah. Like getting to the bottom of whatever rope? I can go based on personal experience and tell you. You, know, you have a threshold. Yeah. And if you spend your, all your life doing one thing out of balance, and it has to adjust. Yeah. You can go from an academic to a yogi really quick. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's very interesting. Um, I, I had an uh, exposure to insecticides uh, uh -huh. when I was about 18 in college. And I was in horticulture. And oh, wow. In a greenhouse, and I was getting uh, industrial doses of uh, various things. Okay. Like Yeah. Insecticides, and they were all carcinogenic, and so I ended up with cancer. Um, and it was an awakening process, and um, a lot of people are in that concept um, in the general population that we have to fight cancer. It's a war against cancer. But what I say to them, and they always kind of go, "What?" Which is, I fell in love with cancer. Mm. I loved cancer. And I loved it until I healed. And I became different in my relationship to my body and mm -hmm. what people call cancer. Because cancer is actually your own human cell in a divergency, mm -hmm. in, a, in a rebellion, or in a different expression. So you just have to communicate. And, and then the, I've, I've never seen this chart before. I'm amazed at this chart because it totally resonated with me. Does it? Experience. Okay. I, I see it as it resonates with my experience as well. Does anyone else feel that this may resonate? That um, psychological turmoil is more likely? It's quite surprising. But I don't think we should know these things. Make them common, common um, factors. Steve Taylor is a great, brilliant man. Look him up. Yeah. And adding to that, I study and meditate a lot doing Dr. Joe Expensive mm -hmm. work and I've been to several events. And so many people are coming in with cancer or intense situations, health problems. Mm -hmm. And at these events, they're having a peak transcendent experience, and <clears throat> and they're getting an upgrade, a biological upgrade, mm -hmm. and the cancer is going away. I mean, or the whatever the disease is, it's, it's really astounding what's happening. So, wow. the meditation, mm -hmm. and then uh, most of these people are. <clears throat> A lot of people are coming in with real, really serious diagnoses. They've mm -hmm. gone through the chemo, gone through all these different treatments, 
or to acupuncture and all this other stuff and nothing's really working and so mm -hmm. finally they show up and some of them have been doing the work for for a while before that and and I'll have a singular moment in a meditation that shifts everything. Um, so I totally agree with that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, transcendent states. Do you need a group or someone to teach you to reach a transcendent state? It can help. It can help. It can help. I think there's yeah. there's a dynamic of the self and and the dynamic of the group, mm -hmm. and then the dynamic of the race. Mm -hmm. And so it depends on how dynamic you are in your dynamics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. That's a really good point. I, I personally um, found a portal through Reiki. Yeah. Was, yeah, that was really, um, I guess I resonated with my soul or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So we're talking about energy. I'd rather do Reiki. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, so if we take this as a digestion and we think about the world and the state of, that it's in, and we all came here to learn something, I guess. Hopefully it was not really something you learned, it was something that reminded, it was just a reminder, more of a reminder for you than it was the learning process, relearning some truth. How do we heal the system? Heal ourselves. Heal ourselves one person at a time. What do we do for someone if we have a loved one who is suffering from substance use disorder? I, I send them love and believe. Send them love. I, I call them their spiritual guide. Mm -hmm. I think that's brilliant. Remove stigmatization, blaming language, and hold strong boundaries to, to help treat substance use disorder. Because if that's really what they're after is them, their natural state. But it's really coming at a cost. It's a doomed attempt to come back to the natural state. obviously that is experiencing this, you know, the addiction, the, the stress, the homelessness, the, the, the ups and downs, the overdoses, you know, constitute that this state. I mean, it is in itself not a, a sure path no. to enlightenment. Uh, thank you for that. So she, we what is your name? Althea. Althea just mentioned that Addiction itself is not a path towards enlightenment. It's not a sure path towards enlightenment. And I can't agree more. And I think that's a very important distinction that needs to be made with this presentation. I'll take that into consideration for future presentations because it, you can kind of get bent on a particular point. And that point needs to come in It's part of this presentation. And that, sure, a minority can have the aha moment but for some people, that's not going to happen. The majority, it won't happen. The vast majority. Yeah. Well, there's quite a number of people in the workaday world who have, who are working stone. On yeah. Something, and it's in almost every phase of our society, and it's not really talked about. Okay. Uh, at the, the, the the executives and a lot of people in prominent life yes. with making a lot of powerful positions for their group or their company are addicted and yet there's a burnout after a while they become unable to maintain mm -hmm. but for a while it pops them to this place where they can work <laughs> yeah and then, and then it's and then the the, the party's over yeah know? and i can and, and then they go into a real decline yeah know? and they need help you know but there's no help for them really unless 
somebody like you comes along and says, hey, you know, yeah. you've got to meditate or you've got to take it your spiritual path. And I would have to say, uh, that was a wonderful point. What was your name? Doug. Doug. So Doug, I'm just re uh, mentioning some of these points that are really important for the video where he's discussing prominent individuals in society that are using substances while operating really key wheels in the machine of society that have great influence and after a period of time they crash and burn after they reach a plateau that they get skyrocketed to a position. And then we have to ask ourselves, do we have a society, which is a valid point and I can relate to that with personal experience in academia and my drinking. Drinking numbed me and allowed me to do things that weren't right for the physical body. Beyond, at the expense of other people, I was able to work harder than anyone else. And then you have to ask, well, we're rewarding them. How do we reward balance and wholeness? How do we reward that? And it comes down to a lot of that societal perspective and capitalism and competition. Uh, you know, under a competition model, that's what happens. And balance is hard. I think it's one of my life lessons. My mother has told me that since I was a kid. I hear it again. I'm going to throw up, you know. <laughs> Your life's about, you got to figure out how to balance things out, Jordan. 100, zero to 100. You know, all or none. Pull the Band-Aid off really fast. Go from academia to yogi in six months. You know, how do we find balance? How do we reward balance? And what is balance? What is it? Wow. That, that just like, boom, this light bulb went on about how we're conditioned. Well, I was in my family. Work, work, work. You know, like, we used to reward people that work. They never sat down. And I've been working with a lot of elderly people, and they will not lay down during the day. Like lazy, you know, or they got this thing in their brain that that's lazy to sit back and then not put your feet up or lay on the couch, you know, elevate your legs that are swelling, you know. And I think it's that old conditioning that it's lazy, you know, you've got to sit up like this all day, and I don't know, I that workaholism, you know, like work, work, work. And well, you said the key word was condition. 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 Yeah, we're conditioned to believe it's crap. It's, and it, it starts in yeah. elementary school. Conditioning. Yeah, and, and there's an author um, called Alfie Cohn, mm -hmm. and he talks about the ca case against the competition or something. He has several books, mm -hmm. and his education is you know, directed at you know, teachers and things like that, mm -hmm. okay. and coming up with a whole new idea mm -hmm. around school and education, mm -hmm. children. Mm -hmm. So it starts there. And they, yeah, yeah. I, I even remember raising my boys. It's like some of these people, their kids have like five activities, and I'm like driving. Like, and then the parents are going nuts, driving them around, trying to. Like, I know. And we're, why? We're, yeah. <laughs> well, well, if we go into the, the history of yoga in America, and then mm -hmm. we go at the, look at the theosophists, where, uh, because right at that time, they were, industrial complex was coming in. And some people were getting wealth that hadn't had it before, and they, then they started looking for health. Before that, they were workaholics. Mm -hmm. Then the, it was so good. And then she came in, uh, you know, this Annie Besson and Blavatsky, and they said, well, let's bring yoga to America and to, and to England. So they set up a center in New York and London, and they brought enlightened teachers by the bushels over here. And you know, there weren't any yoga studios, but now you'll see a yoga studio on every single block of yeah. every city. So did yoga come to America? I would say so. And is transcendence coming to America? I would say so. And I think there's a lot more people doing yoga than there are drugs. Okay, so I'm going to reiterate that point, wonderful point of how yoga came to the West. And now, after a period of time, we see yoga on every block. And this is great evidence for a point of transcendence, where society is headed towards transcendence. More people are doing yoga than actually doing psychedelics. 
And I think that's a fantastic positive point to reiterate for the people online and for the, the future video. Um, what a wonderful positive perspective. You know, it's, it's a good point. You know, I don't, I don't have a statistic, but, I, but you know, as you go around in the city, you don't see as many drug dealers as you do yoga studios. Yeah. So, what if we were to just throw out? Because we're talking about how drugs, what's more prominent, you know, drug use or, or yoga, really, you know, when we're dealing with this. What if we just throw out the logical mind of stats and numbers and just say, what's needed? What's needed? Instead of worrying about the external world, you know, yes, we're in that. We are interacting with that. We're helping co-create that. What if we ask what's needed and live in that space that isn't necessarily in or out? We erode the intellectual construct of in versus out and allow everything to be a blanket of consciousness. Even though things are happening externally, they're not external. There's no internal. That is a mind perspective. So if we take the perception of everything is happening now, in the eternal now, you stay present. This is what I say. Give yourself presence. It doesn't matter what you do. You can wash dishes. You know what's really fun? Being present with your eyes open. Right? Take, take yoga off the damn mat. And start applying it to your life. And they call about in the transcendent state of walking samadhi. Well, try to be present with your eyes open. And when you have a bad day, and I, and I find myself frustrated, pissed off, oh God, got to move again? Kidding me? Another house to clean? All right. Presence. Stepping into the day. Forward thinking of the intellect is one of the things I had to conquer. By conquering, you already know you took the wrong approach, right? Using the word conquer. That is the mind. If you can just settle in to the present moment and observe, it starts with observational consciousness, where you simply observe yourself like an interested observer. You're this being in a body. You have this antenna going up to all that is, the eternal consciousness. And you're in a material world interacting with things. How crazy awesome. And then you integrate that perception, that presence, and you ask yourself, what, what do I need when you're present? When you're in the moment, what do you need? And, well, someone could say, I need cocaine. <laughs> I need my twin flame to show up. I need a better job. Do you? What if we could make the argument that the reality that you need is the reality you experience? Provided that a great deal of needs are met. Yeah. Right? Because yeah. you can't, that works as long as there are, somebody has their physical needs met. Mm -hmm. They have enough to eat, they have yeah. to live. Like those are very real things that contribute a in a massive way. And yep. you can't say that to somebody, hey, have you tried looking at different, like, you're right. Oh, man, I'm hungry. So <laughs> needs need to be met to be present. But if you're present all the time at the expense of your needs, then what happens as well? So you can right. balance again. Right. So I'm interested um, on the perceptions of this talk, the kind of the anything else that comes up. And yeah. So I think where I'm really sitting with this, right, is I agree with, about, with the majority of it. 
Okay. Right. Uh, I work in, in substance use. Okay, good. Um, where is the delivery here? Because that's the piece, right? Like, yeah. <clears throat> the hypothesis, the thesis. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Great. I, I believe it is on point. Okay. But getting people to actually receive this mm -hmm. in real life. Mm -hmm. Right? So, like, have you experienced, like, actually, like, I get the research is, is deep, but have you actually poured to people and yeah. attempting to walk them down this road? I have. Um, most recently was one who had substance use disorder and an awakening process at the same time. And it comes down to the purpose of the individual. And individual coaching or therapy, whatever you want to consider it. It's not a formula. That's, from my perspective right now, it's not a overarching formula to be applied globally to, one, to everyone. What needs to happen from my experience is an understanding, a deep understanding by the individual at the individual level where they feel it. And I create a container, a container that is, I uh, call it the a mirror container where you t create a sacred container and you mirror back to them their fullest potential you dive a little bit deeper under that level of the superficial things you come in you say guess what this is the problem you know and then you go deeper what and you create a container and you only use the material the individual does so that each individual has their solution within them that's individual, what? So it's an individual, that's why I'm coaching. That's why I decided to coach and then I'm gonna take on a mental health professional position as well to work with people who got in problem, tr trouble with the law. It's an individual thing, so case management. Um, treatment, therapy, coaching, and then facilitating that process with physio physiological help. So things and techniques that they can use, that they can do, that they like. Because if you don't like yoga, it's not going to work. Well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, it's not going to work. So you got to you gotta, you gotta work through. So, I, 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 my whole approach is based on the gap. It's based right. off of what? Oh, oh, okay, good. Um, but let me tell you that that is received by a smaller portion. Yes. Yeah, and it's not always going to be in the lens of trauma. You know, we, there's so many, people are complex. We're dealing with a complexity that the mind can never really conceptualize. It's, you know, it's unlimited. We're unlimited. So if you go in and say, I know the answer to your problem. Never. No, I mean, I'm just saying in general. I know you would never do that. Yeah, yeah, but you already know. You already know it's a done deal, right? Because if someone presumes that they have the exact answer for an individual who's a unique expression of source, right. you already they already told you where they are at their developmental level. Because if you don't have faith and confidence in that person's divinity and expression, you're done. So treat each person as a, divine, as a divine being that they are, as you as part of them and them as part of you, and sit down together and support non-judgment, no shame, healthy boundaries are always critical without wanting something energetically. You know, having an agenda, gone, no agenda, and just and this is where we need the government to support case management, healers. We need an army yeah. because it takes individual work with people, one-on-one, -on -one, connection. Without having connection, you're not going to have communication. And without communication, you're not going to solve a problem that's specific to an individual. So I sit down and do the, the, 
the legwork as you do, and um, I care. You work for the government. <laughs> I'll be working with them as well. <laughs> so you do what you can do with an extent because you're making a difference. Just having that frequency, that consciousness, that understanding in a system is an extremely important thing to carry with you. So um, that would be my answer to that. How did that resonate? Eh. Yeah, be honest. You know, what it's, if it's like there's a put me through the gauntlet. Coaches, right? And if somebody's receptive to this particular thing, then here's some tools and language to discuss that. If someone's receptive in another way, I mean, like you've got like a handful of options, right? Yeah. Because mm -hmm. but just but to suggest that the right thing for someone to do is pursue a spiritual path. That's why AA, AA doesn't work for so many people. Yeah. Because they end up feeling like beat over the head with. You get, you get rid of the term spiritual and you replace it with energy. Ah. So what I use is I use a synonym of energy for spiritual. Because spirituality has a connotation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and it's been misused. Yeah. So if you use energy, um, a connection, wholeness, um, that's really getting to the point without having that label. Because why, why would you want, you know, and then we deal with religious versus spiritual and you're down a whole other path. Right. And I would like to really think about, you have a valid point, that's okay, you can do this, you can come here with a solution, but if you're the system itself and you have a particular mm -hmm. approach and platform. Yeah. And I really want to reiterate, yeah. I don't disagree with your approach. No, this the practicality of this is critical. This yeah. And, uh, I, I also really stand with what she's saying, and that's that uh, you know, I preach it all day long. Is that yeah. There is no one road. Mm -hmm. I can't give you the road. I can't give you the answer, right? Yeah. I think that, this, that what you're presenting is actually very close to the overall answer. Uh -huh. But what is the vehicle? How do we deliver it to the actual people that are out there? Suffering? I'm still going to, I'm still in the process of figuring that out. Yeah. That's, that's so, where that's the next chapter of my life, and that's, I'm, I'm, I'm in the process of entering that next chapter to learn how to do that. Right now, I was in the integration process and, and creating and, and coming up with a, something, a common denominator, so to speak, to facilitate a framework to help. But now I have to figure out, we have to figure out, as a society, is how to bring this, how to deliver it, how to have a vehicle to deliver this. And I don't have the answer to that. And if I did, I'd be dancing. But I like dancing anyways. I'm going to tap toe, you know. But that's the next thing we had, you know, as health care professionals, mental health providers. Um, we're going to be advocates. But what we're going to do is we're going to create it together. It's not going to be one person with some sort of theory. It's, it's going to be, okay, where are we? Oh, geez. Where do we go from here? And so it's going to take time. Yeah. yeah so, we're, um, but I—that's why I've loved it. Care. Yeah, yeah, I know. Right, right. Yeah, with trauma. PTSD or yeah, yeah, trauma-informed care. Yeah. So it, it is a, well, I have a question about that. I mean, yeah. just from your experience, is that do you find people reject the idea that it's the trauma at the base of their? Um, My approach is to kind of where you were, and that was very like really generalized trauma, right? And acknowledge that we're all traumatized, mm -hmm. right? And you know, what traumatized me, you might experience the same thing that would traumatize you, and vice versa, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You see a lot of like light bulbs go off in terms of that, right? And it starts to make sense because our approach has always been to treat behavior. Yeah. Uh, I also work with, with military folks. Mm -hmm.
dealt dealing with that, with whether it's you know, bereavement or disease or facing that. And I think that that's bringing us to a, a, a transcendent point, potentially, mm -hmm. as, a, as a global interconnected experience. I've been experiencing 43 years, I think. <laughs> yeah. So I just want to congratulate and thank everyone who's here. And these perspectives are critical. And ask the audience online, ask them watching later on, and ask the audience here, what, what can you contribute? What do you need? And then how do you help other people receive what they need? Where are we? Where do you want to go? Ask yourself where you're going. We're all busy trying to get somewhere. Where are you actually going? You're trying to heal yourself to do what? Right? Why do you want to do that? What's the point? And how many different forms can that take in different expressions? And we're in a challenging point. We have challenges ahead of us to, to bring to the point of COVID and a transcendental threshold and other people saying, you know, I've been dealing with this for decades. Hasn't changed, you know? Well, there's the term change again, right? What if we could actually change the past by changing by our current decision? What if we could look at time as nonlinear and more quantum approach to things and realize that there's many parts of ourselves also interacting, that we're, it's not just us, that there's a process coming from source. And that this experience, this individuation, this lower self, it's only part of the picture. So what does that mean to you? I mean, what does that mean? I, no one can answer these questions. That's why we're here, is to learn from ourselves, to be part of source within its own creation, to experience and to grow. And when we start to bring things in at a physical level and we try to match things down and we have to put money in the bank account so we can meet the needs in order to even be present, these are challenges. And society has some adjustments that needs to happen. And these adjustments are inevitable. And it's just a matter of what direction it's going to take. Fear is not going to get you there either. So if we can come from a place of wholeness and unity and connection, some would consider that love. Satchitananda, some would consider that the fabric of the universe, also love. Just a simple way for me to describe what love is. Satchitananda, existence, consciousness, and bliss. But there's other ways. Coherent frequency. Coherence of frequency and energy. Um, if we simply stay present and we engage the heart, we engage presence with heart and love, then possibilities open. But if we try to figure it out with the mind itself and intellect, it's not going to work. It's too limited. As I like to say, your consciousness is limitless. Cognition is limited. And even a child, you know, like a child, <laughs> a child understands that. So you can 
multiply exponentially these connections, but it's never going to touch, you know, limitlessness at a level that we're inquiring. So I don't have the answers. I'm a facilitator and a partner and an advocate. That's it. I'm out there with the rest of you, as we all are, with our own challenges. So. Yeah, um, I just have a question about the community of, of people who are working with addictions. And are there um, connections Thank that you. you have in there that keep your own? You know. <laughs> affirmation, you know, of your path, of what you're doing. I mean, that's another big thing. I, I, I work in environmental issues, and that's a really big thing, that you need to always be uh, uh, finding ways to affirm that what you've dedicated yourself to, that you'll be successful so that you can continue. Because that's, not to have that is just traumatizing as well. Not to have affirmation. Not to have, well, I mean, all these things about the brain and all the chemicals and everything. I mean, you can have this transcendent experience. You still have to have those chemicals be keeping you happy and being able to put one foot in front of the other and stay present when you're with your person or you're doing your thing with whatever your job is. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I mean, like that's what I'm thinking about community. Right. You know, mm -hmm. and I, I don't know. It it sort of scared me because of you said, oh, like not that. It's a unique approach, right? This um, uh, uh, Garbord Mate, oh, I can't say his name. Mate, yeah. <laughs> yeah, his, his approach that, about trauma and yeah. like that. So, yeah, it's just, I don't know. It's For me, it's a, it's a small number of people that are, that are there for that particular reason. Um, Good to know. You know, we're just talking about the intricacies of society and community and again the vehicle yeah we, we, we know what's important there's some really good points but do you find that self-hatred is a big hurdle to like maybe that could be part of the yeah um, self-love yeah because if we don't if we can't find it within an act yeah. of love and accept ourselves and forgive ourselves and that's critical have a grace for ourselves how can we give that to other people yes yeah, so we're talking so about Yeah. You know, that's maybe trying to that's necessary for the integration. Yeah, yeah. Yes. All of you is allowed yeah. to exist and all of you is allowed to be Yeah, yeah. No to be there you have to have yeah. you don't have to accept everything. It's like I can show up all polished, but are you gonna accept the icky parts of me? Yes. I'm so cute and pretty. Yeah. You know, am I still accepted? So I think with you know, all of us and whoever is struggling, it's I see you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're just as much a child of God as anyone else. Mm -hmm. We're all the same. Yes. Nobody, oh, I got the PhD. And yeah, it doesn't work, out. does it? You know, it doesn't matter. We're <laughs> all, our souls are all the same. All equal. All equal. Yeah. So getting that just in our conscious, you know. Yeah. That's like that's half the battle. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's what, that's where, and I <laughs> yeah. just, I Not think, in a well, I don't like to, yeah. bash, I don't like to bash yeah. my parents, my earthly people that brought me into this physical being that apparently I chose. Ah! 
<laughs> don't know why I did that. No, I'm grateful. But, um, <laughs> but, <laughs> am I? Uh, it's going to do. But, but it's yourself. like, yeah, it's like, I wish, you know, I always find myself, oh, what would it have been like to be raised by people that 